Uh, so my name is Venetia Sigdale. I'm just finishing up my PhD at Osgoode Hall Law School. I'm also a course director at Osgoode and I'm a course director in the social science department um, here at York University. And um, my, I'm also a lawyer. I was called to the bar in 2007 and I did my LLM at Osgoode and my LLB at Queens and my BA at York. So that's kind of my background. Um, my research, I, I, the agenda overall, I look at corporate law and workers' rights and how we can use corporate governance as a tool to help increase the rights of workers. So I'm going to share my screen so I can um, share my PowerPoint slides with you. So my topic today, uh, Hustling Hard, which draws on my um, 2018 book, uh, Regulation and Inequality at Work. But I wanted to try and get some feedback on ideas I want to um, kind of continue in that same area. Because right now I'm teaching business associations and, and mostly corporate governance. So I'm kind of moving away from labor and employment and I want to shift back and, and, and revisit that work. So just a quick slide, you know, in the 1800s that oftentimes um, joining a union was actually uh, criminalized, right? So there was no real ability to um, collectively bargain. And um, as I said here, right, with the advent of, of legislation to limit working hours, and eventually we see health and safety standards. Um, and it was also the advent of the welfare state. So if you were, uh, before the advent, sorry. So if you were not able to provide for your family, they could literally starve to death. And we see in the 1900s, uh, workers were, were not that much better off, obviously, than the 1800s, a slow transition. And this slow increase of uh, the acceptance of unions. And this is coupled with the introduction of health and safety legislation, allowing workers to gain gr greater protection. Um, and we see the language I used here in 2018 in developing nations, there was a lag behind the developed world. Well, now I would use language like in the global um, south, the difference we see compared to the global north and, and what is actually um, happening in certain parts of the world and the differences, right? Just different jurisdictions. So in the 2000s, we see this continued rise in, in corporate social responsibility, right? Transitioning out of the 1900s. And we see the rise of the ethical consumer, those consumers who care about where the products they're purchasing are sourced and then where they're manufactured. So thinking about the supply chain and how do we manage that? How do we attach risk to the Canadian corporation when they're operating abroad? So that's kind of the focus of that research. And, and as I said, right, we can think about those as equally important, the use of labor for mining and, and picking cotton to sewing garments in factories, right? Where does the labor originate and, and how does it travel along supply chain? What countries uh, does the supply chain flow through and ultimately um, to the Canadian uh, market, right? And so the turning to the gig economy, right, because that's just the background of all these rights that workers slowly were able to fight for and gain, right? These, these rights weren't given freely, they were fought for. And so the gig economy is pitched as freedom from the typical nine to five job, right? That's the original kind of um, lure and, and what they, they claim is advantageous. You can go surfing in the day and you drive for Uber at night. Uh, this is at your own convenience. You do not have to be tied to these typical office hours. And what that's how it's pitched, right? And that's what it's, it's, it's said to actually be this, you know, freedom. But what it actually means is that you do not have the legal coverage as employees, right? Because of the flexibility and the lack of um, legislatively defined categories. And so, as I said, as I argue in my book, they, they pitch this as disruption, right? They're disrupting what it means to be a worker. And it's, it's actually disorder, right? They're just trying to claw back rights that workers have gained since the 1800s and pitch it as freedom. And so um, discussing the topic of alienation, uh, one of my reviewers called the book Marxian light, which is a term I have embraced, right? I don't view my work as Marxist in nature, but it is Marxian light. To think about, um, you know, clawing back or, or stepping back from what the law dictates and, you know, the rights that you have as an employee, whether it be full-time or part-time, and thinking about, well, what can the law not fix, right? What, what exists outside the law? What are problems that the law, um, it, it ha the law has limitations, right? And what are those um, limitations? What can the law not fix? So I use the term isolation and inequality to describe a phenomenon akin to Marxist theory of alienation, 
right? Wherein both workers and management are viewed, are viewing the other as um, somewhat of an enemy and that there are these two sides to be distanced, right? And, and stop relating to each other as humans. And um, I have a quote here, but I, I'll skip over. <laughs> um, and then to think about this separation of ownership and management, right? what does that mean for the gig economy and the gig worker? So Marx invented the language of the separation of ownership and control, which was later adopted by Berlin Means. And Berlin Means are these you know, hugely famous um, scholars in corporate law. And they talk about the corporation using those same terms, the separation of ownership and management, that uh, shareholders are the true owners of the corporation, yet they elect a board of directors who govern in their best interest, right? the best interests of the shareholders, to separate who is investing capital versus who is managing the corporation. And we see this, um, as the quote says, right, that they have adopted that those um, words from, from Marx's usage to, to be applicable in the corporation. And so um, workers being alienated from their work product and uh, as it says, right, I'll, I'll lays the foundation of corporate or corporate governance theory about the separation of ownership and management. But, but how does that get, um, I guess, almost reabsorbed or, or transitioned uh, in, in the gig economy? Because the person who is a gig uh, worker for or drives a car for Uber, it's their car, right? They own that car. So you are now being um, forced to provide the tools for your ability to work. So similar to in, in law, what is the test for an independent contractor? Do you own your tools? And so one issue I raise in the book that I think is worth revisiting is, is who trained you, right? That the gig worker who is driving for Uber has no training, right? What's the, requir the requirement? You have to have a driver's license and that's about it. So I, I draw this, um, or I start this discussion about, you know, workers don't want to be micromanaged, right? But there is some need for a management function to be served. So to think about, um, you know, talk about training on the job, that without a manager, how is training to be accomplished? Who trains the Uber driver or the Airbnb, um, Airbnb host on how to be a host? That, um, you know, the, the answer is no one, right? These people just open up their, their houses as, uh, you know, Airbnb, or they start using their own car, their own personal vehicle to drive for Uber. And so, as I said, this lacks training, but it also lacks a complaint process, really, right? Obviously, you're able to rate your um, Uber driver on the app, but how can you really kind of almost uh, correct behavior, or when we think about discipline and discharge in the labor and employment context, that how did someone get a warning? How were they able to um, almost be retrained? Well, in this case, they haven't been initially trained. So how can you retrain the person? So this becomes a problem, right? From the get-go, from the start of driving for Uber, you've never been trained. And so in um, this article by JP Morgan, Chase & Co., they talk about the fact that turnover is very high in the gig economy. Um, for online platforms, and um, it, it's also difficult to sustain growth, they talk about, right? And, and this is a big problem when we think about labor and employment law and human resources, retention, right? Recruitment and retention. How do you recruit someone to join and work for you, or join your workplace, and how do you then retain them, right? How do you make sure that they don't leave? Because all of this training that you've kind of put into them, invested, however you want to frame that, um, if they leave, now you have to retrain or you have to start training someone else. So you've lost that, um, you know, kind of uh, that time and energy. And so how much does Uber really even care about that? Because someone else will just be quickly um, willing to drive for Uber. Um, gigging the economy, what's old is new again, right? When we think about the rise of the gig economy, we think about this in, in quite recent times, but we can actually go back and, and revisit to think about, you know, some positions have always been gigs, as I mentioned here, and the only new de development is kind of how, how much this has grown. And um, we can think about writers who have written in the past uh, in a series, you know, a, um, serialization, and they're paid on this rather inconsistent basis, um, and, and how common that was. And now we're returning to that kind of method of having work be precarious and, and piecemeal. Um, 
So I also talk about workplaces and workspaces. And again, please recall that I wrote this in 2009, 2018, and I was questioning what does a typical workspace look like and what should it look like? And obviously, you know, there are certain legal requirements necessary that, you know, health and safety and, and ventilation and things like that. And I, I talk about open offices and, and how those can be problematic if you're trying to have a confidential conversation and you don't really have uh, privacy. And um, we can think about, again, turning back to Uber, that your workplace is now your own vehicle, right? So you kind of take your workplace with you no matter where you go. And um, I use that term workspace, right? To say it's not just this place that you go to, a workspace is any space in which you work. And um, to think about, you know, back in 2018, possible that, you know, you're working at Starbucks one day, um, you know, typing on your computer, and the next day you're working in a park, right, this kind of um, ability to, to be flexible, and any space can be your workspace, which is good and bad, right, that your work follows you everywhere, yet you, as an individual person, can work anywhere, right, at your convenience, and, um, you know, again, this was kind of dated now, obviously, living through a pandemic, uh, what works spaces mean is very different and, and so many people are working from home but what does that mean now for a gig worker who if you're driving for uber is in a very vulnerable uh position right relative to what they were in even a couple of years ago now working through a pandemic uh technology and the ever lengthening chain right so to think about how much has technology changed the workplace and workspace and how attached are you to your workplace because of technology um, and uh, to think about not just the worker who is stuck driving attached to an app but we can think about even the high income levels right we don't really feel pity for the surgeon who's making five hundred thousand dollars a year who's working long hours maybe now in the pandemic we do, um, or the lawyer who chooses to work well into the night, right, this partner at a, a fancy firm, and the more they work, the more they get to take a cut of that, right, that, that they're actually in profit sharing, basically. So they're, they're driven to work harder, but we don't feel bad for them, right, well, that they're working essentially overtime, not getting paid for overtime, right, because they're exempt from um, that, the applicable legislation. So unless you are independently wealthy and you don't have to work, you're part of that same group, right? You're a wage slave like everyone else. But I think those people at the higher income levels fail to see themselves as that, right? They don't self-identify as a wage slave. They think, I'm in control. I have autonomy. If I want to work eight hours a day um, as a surgeon or as a partner at a law firm, I can do that. And if I want to work 18 hour days, I can do that. If I want to work four hour days. So that flexibility is available to them in a way that other workers might be uh, envious of. But I'm just, the, the point being that overwork is, um, I guess, uh, rewarded and almost praised in some professions when we look at, in comparison, a factory worker who might be forced to work overtime and might not be paid to work that overtime. But it's still um, a problem of overwork, right? And I, I think those issues are becoming more, um, they're, they're rising to the surface in the pandemic about thinking about burnout and, and, and things like that, that we didn't pity those people, I think at all, um, those high paid doctors and lawyers prior to, or we pitied them less. Um, Um, you know, and we have a little bit of time uh, left. So just to think about uh, worker voice, right? And, and, and who gets to have their voice heard and who is deliberately silent is the, is the quote from uh, Aaron Dutty Roy there. And uh, quickly, just to turn back to the actual title of the presentation, not to be flippant, but in the words of Rick Ross, that's where I basically got my title from, right? That, you know, when you're hustling, it's like this notion of having a side hustle or that you're hustling every day to make money. What is the alternative, right? What is it called when your job is a side hustle for some, right? This notion of an Uber driver who is not, um, that's not their primary job. That's not the only work they do. This is just a side hustle compared to some kind of fancy full-time employment that they have otherwise, uh, which is questionable. Um, and uh, then I just talk about, you know, the need for workers to actually be involved in the governance of their workplace, right? That how much are they alienated? How much are they isolated from, of the ability to govern um, their workplace, right? How much choice and flexibility do workers have? And this um, 
these lies that were were told to them about gig work, right? That, that, that it was flexible and they would be able to kind of make their own hours and, and work when they choose. But it turns out that, you know, it's, it's quite, um, they're being exploited in different ways and outside of legal protections that are given to full-time and part-time workers. We see gig workers um, being left out of that process. So that's everything, thank you. And I will end uh, there and, and stop my share. Thank you, Manisha, for that really relevant and timely topic. Um, I think we can all um, give you a shout out at, as you covered some of the, some of the salient points that are so relevant, the precarious employment and um, the way that you went into such detail um, about the concerns that are part of the gig economy. So thank you for that. Um, I would now like to um, introduce Emil. Emil will be speaking on food delivery and resistance in urban spaces, the case study of platform work in Toronto and Paris. And um, Emil, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit and um, start off on the presentation. Hello everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Emil and I'm a third year PhD student uh, in geography in New York. Uh, my supervisor is Stephen Tufts, which is a, a great uh, coincidence, I guess. And uh, yeah, today I'm gonna be presenting preliminary work for my thesis. Um, this summer I worked for uh, Uber Eats delivering in Toronto, um, having informal conversations with couriers while uh, waiting for meals or uh, in condo lobbies, uh, discussing pay, work, and so on. So um, yeah, let's first um, talk about gig workers. Um, yeah, in the GTA, um, you can see here in green about uh, 9 to 10% of uh, the workers are uh, are considered having done gig work, mostly uh, women and uh, people of color. And uh, this is from a 2019 StatCan uh, report called Measuring the Gig Economy in Canada. Um, and so gig workers are present in many sectors of the economy, uh, mostly office work here. Uh, you have construction, home services, and um, Food, food service delivery, is, it's harder to pinpoint. Um, here you have uh, this, this uh, Canadian uh, from uh, Angus Reid uh, stat that showed that it was, it was around 6%. Um, the CCPA in 2019 did another survey and showed that 19% have worked in food service delivery in the GTA. So, I mean, we can estimate the, the workforce between 24,000 and 76,000 pre-pandemic. And of course, the pandemic had a huge impact on uh, the rise of food delivery. So, um, in 2020, sales and stocks and skyrocketed. This is from the U.S., but the, the Canadian case is, is similar. So, you have companies that either uh, took this opportunity to merge or uh, to go public. So Just Eat, for example, the European giant for food delivery bought uh, Grubhub for $7 billion. Um, you also have uh, Amazon that started funding Deliveroo, uh, which is a near, uh, European company that went public last year, and for half a billion dollars in return for 16% of the shares of uh, the company. And so uh, at the same time as more and more people order food and deliver food, uh, companies like Uber Eats um, slowly are decreasing pay rates. Um, this is from Gig Workers United, uh, showed that the total pay of workers is more and more depending on tips. And so the, uh, during the 2020 uh, year, this was strongly denounced by Gig Workers United, the, 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 the pace started to decrease and workers had to rely more on tips to, to make ends meet. Um, and this brings me to the actual work of doing uh, of, of food delivery. Um, a lot of couriers work for a lot of platforms and I've experienced that this summer, the algorithmic management of couriers. It's, it's hard to, to look for the best uh, kilometer per hour ratio um, 
either car or bike. Uh, most couriers in Toronto use e-bikes. And depending on your rating and the number of deliveries you've done, uh, you're going to have the best or the worst orders. And so this is from uh, a Sunday that I did in Toronto where the algorithm just uh, kept bringing me further and further away from downtown. And uh, as, as the surge lowered, so you can see uh, the this, this surge was uh, 250, like a boost extra to inside workers. But as the day like went on, uh, the surge lowered and I got pushed further and further and away uh, with my regular bike. So it was, it was quite a lot of biking. Um, and there was also this notion of geofencing, which is uh, keep it, keeping workers apart from each other uh, in order to prevent them from organizing. Um, the other concept that I want to discuss is gamification. So the gamification of labor is to have video games features um, in your platform. And this is seen in food delivery. So um, you have countdowns, sys points reward systems and ratings and so on. And so with Uber Eats, for example, you're going to have, um, you're going to have a ping which is a, an order offer. Uh, and you only have a couple of seconds to accept. And when, when your area is surging, you're gonna have a lot of pings that your phone is gonna like always be vibrating. And this is super dangerous because if you're, you have to keep your eyes on the road if you're biking in traffic. Um, also the map behind the order is completely frozen. So you can't zoom in or out to see what route you're gonna have to to go from a uh, restaurant to, to destination. So it's harder to estimate how long it's gonna take you. Uh, they also don't show you routes, but just a straight line. So again, it makes it hard to estimate how long it's gonna take. Um, the offer is always without the tip. So tips can vary from 20 cents to $20. And finally, you just, sometimes you have multiple orders. So you're gonna have to go through a bunch of restaurants to a bunch of destinations. And so, so it's really hard to, to, to have an idea of how, you, how much you're gonna make. Um, and so work, work conditions are difficult. Um, and this, is, it sparks, this sparks resistance by workers. And so uh, in 2019, uh, Foodsters United was launched uh, in efforts to unionize with CUPW. And um, after the strikes and protests, uh, the Ontario Labor Relations Board ruled uh, the career, food or career as dependent contractors, which means that they could go forward with unionization. Uh, but then Fudora announced some weeks later that it was pulling out of Canada. And today Uber Eats uh, is, push, is pushing for a new employment category, uh, Uber drivers too. Which is uh, called, which would be called flexible work plus, and it's basically a Canadian Prop 22, and Prop 22 is a Californian uh, exception that uh, was passed in the last election. And so this situation in Toronto, where in my thesis, I wanted to compare with the Paris situation, which is also very interesting. Um, Deliveroo is the, uh, that you see here in green, is the second biggest company operating in France after uh, Just Eat with around 10,000 drivers pre-pandemic. And similarly to Toronto, uh, Uber Eats and Deliveroo uh, slowly decreased pay rates during the 2020 pandemic year while sales increased. And um, this sparked a national, like nationwide protests in France and um, Today, for example, Deliveroo is facing multiple legal issues uh, for uh, undeclared labor issues dating back all the way back to 2015. Um, the labor minister called on uh, Deliveroo and Uber Eats to uh, do something about the subletting of, uh, of courier accounts, which is, a, which is a crazy phenomenon where French citizens are, are renting their, their courier account on the Uber Eats or Deliveroo platforms to undocumented migrant workers that want to deliver platforms but don't have the, the, the work visas. And so this brings me to my, my, my third company that I want to discuss, which is Prishti. Uh, it's a home cooked meal company based in Paris. And um, Prishti was in the spotlight last summer after many journalists exposed uh, the 
exploitation of undocumented migrant. And the company was basically organizing a monthly competition between workers to see who could bike the most kilometers. And, uh, and at the end of the summer, migrant workers the delivering for Frischti the, decided to march the streets, organize strikes with the CGT, the Confédération Générale du Travail, in order to get working visas in exchange for the, uh, the immense workload that they were doing. And so after all these, these protests, uh, half of the workforce was, um, was like regularized, but many had to sign uh, NDA agreements uh, not they couldn't speak about the meetings that they had with the the company. Uh, some other workers got a thousand euros in comp in compensation and were then laid off. And so um, I'm interested in connect collect connecting all of this with um, geographical theory. And so my framework aims to uh, build a political economy of platform gig work. Um, and so first we have, uh, we have the urban dimension and uh, critical urban studies and the, the critique of techno-scientific management of cities dating back to Le Favre. And we know that, for example, technological change in production, consumption, uh, transportation, and uh, communication is, is driving the process of capitalist urbanization and vice versa. And that the, the, the contemporary trends in the, the urban entrepreneurial paradigm is to try to find this universally replicable models for cities like the smart city or the sustainable city, creative city, and so on. And so this, coupled with uh, big data algorithms and AI, makes for, um, makes for this, this very... Um, well, called techno-scientific um, management of cities. And Uber, for example, has now gigantic amount of data on transportation with Uber drivers, uh, restaurants with Uber Eats, uh, consumer consumption of, of meals in, the, in more than 300 cities in the world. And they can sell this data for, to the highest bidder. And second of all, the decolonial approach for investigating cities and the urban condition, which views uh, the Euro-America region as deeply impacted by, by its colonial past and subaltern agency. And so we have the, the, the Paris uh, metropolis center of, of the colonial empire and the settler city of Toronto. But most importantly, this approach invites us to look at migration uh, and the urban space as a site for remaking of citizenship, uh, the role of work in migration and the role of migrant workers in cities, um, like migrant workers that decide to do platform work uh, for Uber uh, is, is not, uh, Canada, for example, is not um, work that can count towards uh, citizenship. Uh, and then you have the labor dimension, um, and so for uh, feminist political economy, for example, the urban is not only a site of production and accumulation, but also of reproduction of workers. And we see, for example, the privatization of social reproduction, uh, the, the cost of housing and the commodification of, of work like cooking meals that are integral part of, um, of this case. Um, and it's also important to keep, the, keep in mind the intersectionality of platform workers, whether uh, gender, race, class, and migration status. And finally, uh, the last theoretical inspiration for the for this is the for this project is labor geography. And have we been, as we have seen, uh, unions are very implicated in um, in the upcoming political struggle. Um, and uh, they either for organizing the movement, you have grassroots organizations and so on. And so I think uh, I'm going to finish on that. So I think in conclusion, it's important uh, to keep in mind that uh, platform gig work is part of a racialized capitalist system and that the devaluation of, of like non-white bodies in Euro-America 
has been incorporated in economic processes. And so we've seen workers of, of color, gender, class, migration status attributed this, this type of work, especially in, in major uh, Atlantic cities, transatlantic cities. And so I think there's, a, there's definitely a polarization within big cities and the tension between uh, a techno-scientific capitalist urbanization and uh, social movements of workers, traditional unions, and so on. And uh, finally, I think the location and trajectories of deliveries is an important element that um, I wanna focus on. So meaning that um, the orders occur in certain neighborhoods and uh, the, the couriers are mostly do not live there. And so for that, um, I'm gonna start my field work in the coming, uh, coming weeks, uh, interviewing couriers, organizers, elected officials and so on. And uh, I'm gonna gather information, I'm gathering information uh, through online groups, forum posts, uh, Reddit, Facebook, uberpeople.net. And, um, and yeah, gonna keep uh, doing uh, participatory observation, meaning just uh, biking, doing career work. And uh, that's about it for me. So thank you for showing up today. <laughs>